All right. So welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, for those of you guys who are just tuning in for the first time, we actually started this group back in April of 2020 uh, with the purpose of trying to just be the go-to resource for all things commercial real estate related. And since then, we've been be able to have awesome speakers come by and talk about a, a variety of different commercial real estate concepts. And really today is no exception. We have Hunter Thompson who uh, has written a book on raising private cap or raising capital. And I I've had the privilege of reading the book. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Uh, I have it on my audible. Uh, I've read it actually twice. I read one la once last year. And then before this interview, I actually uh, took a listen to it as well again, but really I I'm excited to have you because I think you're going to provide a ton of value to everyone uh, listening. Thanks. Appreciate it. Honor to be on. Oh, for sure. Yeah, of course. So to start out, what we usually like to do is learn a little bit more about the person that's really across the way from us. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself and really what got you interested in real estate? Sure. So um, for the people that haven't yet heard of me or read my book, I'm sorry, I'm trying. I'm going to, this is the whole conversation is going to be how hard I am trying to be known by you. And I, everything I'm doing all day, every day is to try to make sure that there are less and less of you out in the world. So um, if you don't know anything about my story, I'll give it, keep it brief. Cause I think a lot of people may, but um, I started in this industry around 2010. I um, was very fortunate in terms of the market timing, obviously graduated college, recognized there was probably going to be a huge opportunity in real estate because the prices were just very depressed from a, a historical standard and moved out to California, not because of anything directly related to real estate, but I just felt that that's where the opportunity would be. And the combination of those two things, which I do talk about in my book, um, were really, really influential in terms of how my career would go because in California, the market was so depressed and had collapsed so significantly that it acted as a massive filter for less sophisticated investment strategies. So when I started building a thesis around how, my, how I viewed the space, it was influenced only by people that were able to weather that storm. And so the first investments I made were in you know, 15 to $50 million properties and syndications as a passive LP investor. And that's a term that has become quite popularized recently. But you have to remember, you know, 2010, 2011, that's before the Jobs Act. So you couldn't even talk about real estate deals on the internet yet in any degree of specificity. So I was very fortunate to be a little bit ahead of the curve and very fortunate to be probably the most favorable time to invest in commercial real estate in the history of the United States. Um, but what I recognized is that I didn't want to be an operator. I did not want to handle property specific business plan implementation. I loved the concept of passive investing. I want to defer to other people's expertise. I'm a huge fan of the division of labor. As much as I can spend the time doing things I love, the more money I'll make, the more scalable my business would be and the happier I will be. And so I wanted to identify experts and leverage their time, energy, access to capital, et cetera, and perhaps invest with them. And then, you know, as I moved later in my career and developed a track record, raise capital for other people's deals. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Oh, for sure. So you, you mentioned that, you know, from the, from 2010 to today, the concept of, you know, raising capital to purchase commercial opportunities has become a lot more pro popularized. So can you kind of explain number one, what do you mean by that? So are you doing something related to syndication? And if so, what does that mean? Precisely. So I think when most people think about real estate, especially you know, previously to the Jobs Act, overwhelmingly, most real estate transactions are uh, someone wants to buy a single family property, perhaps they're going to rent it out, perhaps they may even hire a property manager. But if something goes wrong at the property level, the property manager will call the owner. What I wanted to do is put myself in a position where there's an extra layer between me and the asset. So in a syndication, which I'm sure a lot of your attendees are familiar with, um, passive investors are pooled together by an operator or a general partner, which is usually referred to as a GP. And that GP oversees everything to do with the deal, the business plan, implementing the business plan, whether or not rents should be raised or reduced or that property should be refinanced or sold, et cetera. And if something goes wrong in the property level, let's say there is um, an accident on the property or there's a termite infestation or the, the roof needs to be fixed, the property manager may call the operator but the operator is never going to call the passive investor and say, hey, look, 
we got a huge problem. You're probably exposed to liability here. Um, we don't really know what to do about this capital expenditure. What are your thoughts? No, I wanted to simply play the game of creating lucrative returns. And then as I started to realize that it was just a very favorable way to invest, um, you know, I made the mistake that a lot of people make was getting outside of my unique ability. My unique ability was not operating real estate. My unique ability is kind of things like I'm doing now, um, talking to investors, communicating, creating content, being um, someone who makes bold claims and, and stands out from the crowd, those types of things. And um, I'm, I have a pretty uh, significant background in conducting due diligence and underwriting, et cetera. But when it comes to explaining complicated ideas, uh, that's something that I have a knack for that uh, really does stand out. And so I decided to find people where their real standout skill set is operating, managing, implementing, and I can find great partners and therefore be diversified across a variety of different sectors by doing so. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think that plays itself to your highest and best use. Like what is your highest and best use? What are you most efficient at? What are you most effective at? And then try to identify that and, and work at it. So uh, that's awesome. So one thing I wanted to talk to you about is maybe if we can touch back to the beginning. Uh, when you first were starting to get started, the, the transition to California, can you can you talk to us a little bit about maybe the first time that you started raising capital for a deal and maybe some of the lessons you learned across that 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 horizon? Sure. So, you know, I think that I did the thing that a lot of people probably watching this have done, which was well, first of all, we uncover real estate for ourselves, right? We're not born real estate syndicators. In fact a lot of institutions are set up to lie to us that you know investing in the stock market's the only way somehow the stock market doesn't even provide cash flow yet everyone's dream of retirement is having their passive cash flow there to pay off their expenses so we we go through school we go through college we go through our foray into the world of professionalism and no one ever sits us down and says hey look this is the way wealth is actually created particularly multi-generational wealth in this country it's very straightforward um, through owning significant assets that are tax deferred <laughs> and can be transferred in terms of multi-generational like kind of transfer. So, but because we had to uncover it for ourselves, it's like the movie in Inception where no one came up and just presented us with this idea. And then we were like, oh, is this person lying to us? No, we uncovered it. The act of uncovering it is so powerful that what happens is we think once we've done it, that we can simply go do that exact thing to someone else. We can't do it. We can't just simply say, hey, look, here's a great deal. Give me your $100,000. Isn't this such a good deal logically? Because we're trying to streamline all that time that we out on our own fruition had to uncover, we're trying to streamline it into a 30 minute conversation. So that's exactly what happened with me. I had success investing passively as an LP. I had developed an excellent strategic partnership with someone who went on to produce outsized returns, you know, 25% types of returns for many, many years, and including with my capital. And I basically said, hey, look, I've had years of experience now as an LP investor. What I'm going to do is pull investors together in an LLC and simply invest in this other person's deal. And what I'll do is I'll go to them and say, look, I'm not talking about investing $50,000 here. I'll invest a half a million with you, but you have to give me favorable terms to my investing entity. And they said, great, look, if it's a half a million, that's fine. If it's a million, even better. But if it's less than half a million, there's no reason for us to give you favorable terms. So I said, no problem. I've got the track record, got a great relationship. I can probably reach out to some friends and family and pull half a million dollars together. And so what I did was I started creating like a, a business plan for what's basically come to be known as the fund of funds model. I didn't really know it at the time. And the way I was going to do this was I had a lunch, invited all the wealthiest friends and family I knew, hey, bring your rich friend, bring your rich uncle, whoever, you know, someone that owns a franchise, perfect, bring them to this lunch. And there was actually only room for 20 people at this lunch and 30 people showed up and they're all accredited investors. So a minimum net worth of about $30 million. And I texted the person who was supposed to be my friend at the time, but really I was just kind of in love with her and is now my wife and said, you know, I can't wait to celebrate this. I'm confident we're going to get our first million under management. And once you have a million, you can obviously compound on a million. 
So like it's off to the races. And I gave the presentation of a lifetime. You know, it's my first one, but I would have done the same presentation today about the mobile home park business, which at the time was trading at 10 caps. So I was thinking you buy these assets in cash and you don't even implement the business plan, you get a 10% return, let alone what's going on if you, you know, include debt financing. And there's all these other nuances. Again, back in 2010, not a lot of people were talking about mobile home parks. They were just so favorable. And after the presentation, I gave everybody a piece of paper and said, you know, write the number you want to invest down and fold it up because I want you to be able to keep it private. Take some food, get a glass of wine. Okay, great. I'll see you guys later. And I went up to my room and unfolded the paper and counted all the money out. And I raised a grand total of zero dollars. Nothing. Goose egg. So I'm going to pause there because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are watching this that have been through something similar, but I was not emotionally prepared for that. The financial component was one thing and the relationship was another thing, but just being embarrassed about that, uh, you know, I couldn't have done any worse. So that's my story about how I started my career. <laughs> no, for sure. And, and, and again, like you said, disconnecting that rejection from being, being personal, I'm assuming is, is something that a lot of people struggle with. And I'm sure that would be something that I would struggle with as well. If I, if I approach someone in particular, if you have a relationship with them and you're looking for quote unquote raising capital, and then you realize that, Hey, they're not interested in this particular opportunity. It's probably pretty easy to take that kind of personally, which I'm sure is what happened in this scenario. Well, I just thought that I had a couple of skills that I thought would be able to carry me through as they had previous in my life. Right. So like I have good communication skills. I have a knack for kind of being enthusiastic about something and communicating that enthusiasm. You know, I have a background in sales or whatever. And there's a big difference between, you know, I worked for Cutco for a summer and did quite well there. And so I figured, look, this is just, okay. It's not a $500 piece in knives, but $50,000, $500. What's the difference? There's a huge difference when you're catering to accredited investors that are going to give you their 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars, not for a product, but as an investment over multiple years in an illiquid investment that they're not interested in, or they would have been investing in already. So you're trying to convince them that not only should they invest in real estate for the first time, that it should be in the mobile home park business of all things, which again, now is kind of in trend, but at the time they're like, what the tenant base is insane. Like what's going on with that? Like who would want to manage these properties, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a major, major hurdle. Oh, for sure. So I guess that lends itself to this next question, which is related to when do you think it's an appropriate time to start raising capital? Because again, maybe was that, was that first time uh, that you did start trying to raise capital? Was that the appropriate time for you, at least written reflection? Absolutely. And here's why. I was not the man. My whole investment thesis was I've uncovered this excellent strategic partner that is unquestionably an industry leader. All I'm doing is saying that I've conducted all this due diligence and I was extremely competent when it came to that particular topic. I had flown around the country looking at deals. I had met with the on-site managers. I had done a ton of analysis and due diligence and looking at economics and et cetera. I was very, I could answer any question anybody had, but I made a mistake thinking that raising money is about trying to get someone to invest with you, to convince them to like not take no for an answer. And the reality is raising capital is all about creating a robust online infrastructure where you can attract thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of leads, nurture them through replicatable, repeatable pieces of content and touch points. And then by the time you have a deal that's available, they're so eager to invest, they smash the subscribe button and your deals become oversubscribed. And that sounds like a infomercial or whatever, but you know, but we raised about almost $9 million in 17 days recently, not from institutions and family offices and blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about a hundred investors investing a hundred thousand dollars or something close to that. Right. And that's what I've done for the last 10 years is go from not being able to raise a nickel to being able to send out an email or two and receive millions of dollars of commitments. And that's what my book is all about. 
Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to elaborate on that because I think what you said is extremely important, which is related to content creation and brand building, establishing a brand and, and an expertise in the marketplace where people tr like and know and trust you. So could you kind of explain what some of the strategies that you used to employ over the last few years uh, and how they've been able to, you know, get you to the point now where you can raise, you know, $9 million in 17 days, because that's no small feat. Yeah. Um, so the key is that just the attract, the, the, there's four phases, basically. Attract, just getting as many eyeballs on you, your company, your platform, your website, your podcast, whatever it is that your medium is that you suggest or that you feel most inclined to and that you're going to be consistent with. Um, educate through, let's say, ebooks or summits or conferences or quizzes, and then nurture through additional touch points whether it be follow-up webinars or frequently asked questions, just trying to get in front of whatever questions or hesitations your investors would likely feel. And as opposed to running from them, leading with them. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that in a second. And then C, close, which is what everyone thinks raising money is all about. It's the least important. And if you can focus all of your time on reading all the books about, you know, not taking no for an answer and just being out there and outgridding someone. And, oh, you said you had a problem and I gave you a solution. And aren't you going to give me your quarter million dollars? That's not how it works dealing with really savvy people, um, which, which we were talking about, you know, six figure investments. So that's what the real process of raising capital is all about is focusing everything on the attract, educate and nurture phase. So that by the time you send out a deal, you know, we will frequently raise capital where less than 10% of our investors will want to even schedule a call. But it's not because they're not savvy. We cater to extremely savvy investors. It's just that we're very dialed in in terms of anticipating what objections they may have and giving them an extremely, extremely robust amount of information so that they can answer those questions, not on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but on a very scalable, replicatable basis. Um, can I just give one example just to provide oh, some? Oh, yeah, context? please, please. So right now we're very bullish on the senior living industry. And you can probably see why that industry has a lot of question marks in a lot of people's minds, which, by the way, is one of the reasons that we're bullish on it. Um, probably a lot of the attendees are familiar with the demographic play, and there's this massive influx of interest in that space. And because of that, there's a massive increase in liquidity and cap rate compression that's likely going to be happening, et cetera. But we had this big question mark surrounding COVID, where if one of your tenants gets COVID, you could see a situation where it could go through that community very quickly. And the residents are higher risk, significantly higher risk when it comes to the risk surrounding COVID. So as opposed to put out an investment thesis in an operating deck or a marketing deck, that says, hey, look, we've got this 7.8% cap rate in a great growing market in Florida. You know, we could put out an ebook that says, did COVID kill the senior living industry? Right. And that is just so much more powerful than trying to focus on the IRR. Because what we're trying to do, and now I'm giving you the look behind the scenes, what we're trying to do is that experience that we all felt when we uncovered for ourselves how awesome real estate was, we're trying to give them the yellow brick road so that they can do that for themselves. So they can go, oh, I totally, if they can go, oh, I totally, that totally makes sense. And you know what? That's exactly the way that I think. In the sense of we want to incept them with the idea so they go, oh, I was probably going to say that if I just thought about it for one more second. But then what they do is they go to their other high net worth friends and go, hey, check out how smart I am because I uncovered this. And then it kind of goes viral, right? And so that's what this is all about. And of course, we're willing to kind of put in this work because at the end of the day, we're very confident in our deals. You know, I invest in every single deal. I'm usually one of the largest investors. Our compensation is overwhelmingly focused on performance. So we implement these strategies because we want to help people achieve lucrative returns. Oh, for sure. And you, you align with your mission, right? You're trying 100%. to make sure that they understand that you're in, you have the skin in the game. And I really like that idea of creating some sort of content that you know, bring someone along in the journey. So like, 
in the case of the senior housing facility where you're like, is senior housing dead now that, you know, COVID is such a big, right. big deal because now they come to the conclusion for themselves and they're much more likely to want to invest with you. If they themselves come to the conclusion, instead of you force feeding that idea down their throat, I know that that's probably how I would respond at any time I'm dealing with a salesman or anything, anyone who just tries to push an idea down my throat, it's, it usually doesn't go over well. So totally. Uh, and the, I just kind of wanted to, to start with that story. Cause like, that story about me totally bombing my capital raise. Like the reason I tell that story is that everyone that's on this uh, webinar is there's three options. You've either gone through one of those or you haven't, and you're about to, or you're currently going through one and you don't understand it's never going to end, but it will. Everybody that has been successful in this industry has had one of those gut punching moments and was like, do I need to bail and go work for Morgan Stanley or whatever? And they all, they went through it. And then by the way, they've gone through it a billion times since then. It's just that they've gotten more comfortable with it. It's just the first one really makes you question your existence. Oh, for sure. But that's literally anything you, that's worthwhile pursuing is going to, you're going to feel that way when you're first that's starting That's so out, true. So. That is exactly right. That's awesome. So one of the things you do talk about in, in your, in your, in your book as well is related to, you know, creating some sort of pitch deck or, or a, a compelling reason for someone to want to invest in that particular opportunity. So could you kind of explain maybe some of the structure that you take as far as, you know, presenting an opportunity to an investor? Yeah. So some people call it a pitch deck or whatever. I usually call it an executive summary. That's just the term that I am used to. And this is basically an opportunity for you to take Get people's attention, number one, present something in a really compelling graphically designed PDF. And I can't stress this enough. A graphic design is one of the best ways that you can spend your money as a real estate entrepreneur. Because if you spend somewhere between $500 and $1,000 on the deck, which is pretty inexpensive, it will pop off the page and make you appear extremely professional. If you don't, and even if you are extremely professional and you just have basically a beefed up Word document, man, you're going to cost yourself at least one investor and that alone could pay for the $1,000 or $2,000, et cetera. So that's the first thing. And I know that's maybe not what most people are interested in, but I'm going to keep harping on this point until I see that everyone's kind of dialed in. If you're looking for a graphic designer, just go to upwork.com, U-P-W-O-R-K.com. And if I were kind of doing a, a deck, I'd probably pay someone in the range of $30 an hour. I feel like you can get great quality uh, graphic design and an international uh, from international talent at $30 an hour. So um, here's a couple of things to think about when creating your decks though. Uh, using icons, data points, charts, graphs, et cetera, can communicate really complicated concepts without over texting and making it look like a super boring book that no one wants to read. So if I can just get your attention just for a second and grab, like, let's say, for example, the senior living business, you're going to see the tsunami of demographic shifts that's about to happen where everyone that's currently 70, once they're 85, it's going to be all this interest in the space. I want to show that in a chart and then under I'll kind of add some paragraphs as far as some additional details there. What ends up happening is that we assume completely incorrectly that everyone cares what we say. And so we go into this graphic, we go into this um, document process thinking that people are going to read every single word and every single email we write is assuming that they read the previous email. But these are accredited investors who are super busy. Think about it like this. What do you do to the emails that are not related to your business? Because passive investors are not in your business. So think about it like that. When someone's trying to get your money, how often are you open their emails? Are you even putting your email in your main email address? Like those types of things. That's what we're dealing with when it comes to passive investors. So even if someone's going to give us $50,000, you know, they're going to look at the deck and then maybe I can grab their attention just for a moment. And if I can get their attention for a moment, I may be able to turn them into a scanner, right? So it's like, okay, now I'm actually going to take a look and maybe scroll through this a little bit. And then if I can get that, perhaps I can use a couple of bullet points and really compelling subject lines and headers and maybe I can turn them into a reader. Now, if I can get them to read it, I can probably get them to, to give us $100,000 if I can make that thesis really compelling. Now, there's all these tactics I can go into in terms of like the structure and, and the underwriting stuff and all that, but we, we are incorrect 
in assuming that accredited investors have the time uh, to just go through all these decks. We've got to stand out but through graphic design, and then the rest is going to be a lot more easy. Oh, for sure. And, and again, humans are visual creatures. And this is something that I learned immensely in, in Toastmasters, which is a, a leadership oh, organ. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a public speaker, leadership cool. organization, etc. And they teach you this, they beat it into you, they say, look, you should not have a significant amount of words on whatever presentation you're doing. Because again, people, a picture's worth a 1000 words, if you can create something that's compelling enough for someone to resonate with, then that is going to be more effective than you know, you writing a thesis on why you believe a certain concept is the way you should approach it. So uh, totally. that's awesome. Big yeah, fan of that organization. I, Toastmasters, we kind of, we have a mastermind for capital raisers and the name is Raise Masters. And I would say it was definitely inspired by Toastmasters. So very cool. Oh yeah. No, if you guys get a chance, it's definitely a worthwhile investment uh, of your time for sure. So I, I think this kind of lends itself back to what we were talking about as far as securing funds. So once you've kind of provided the pitch deck to someone and they've shown somewhat of an interest. I'm assuming at that point you have some sort of consultation uh, where you, you know, you explain exactly what the opportunity is and then ask for the, 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 the raise. So could you kind of explain what you do from the point where they, you know, they, if they find interest in what your, the opportunity is, and now you guys schedule a time to actually meet. Totally. So the scheduling a call, let's, let's be really cautious about that because I want to make sure people don't make an error that a lot of people make, and I certainly made at the beginning of my career, which is thinking that a call to action on your website, um, that scheduling a call should be like the first thing that you do. And it's definitely not. So if you have a website and if I scroll through it and the big kind of value add that I can potentially get is that I can schedule a call with you. I would take that down and replace it with something that I can opt in and you can establish credibility instantly without requiring any of my time. So I want, that's the first thing. I see that really, really frequently. And what it means to me is that you have time to do calls with cold leads. And that's not a credibility booster at all. All we care about at the beginning is establishing credibility. So when I write an ebook, for example, as soon as they open it, the goal should be like, wow, I'm going to open their emails from now on because they know what they're doing. That's all I'm trying to communicate. Then let's say an email three, four, five, maybe after investment opportunity has been presented, there can be a prompt for a call now that we know that they're opening their emails and they're more interested and there's actually a way for them to click the button and send the $50,000. So once we do that, though, I try to think about it like this. Again, because we're so like, we tend to be nerds, right? We're real estate investor nerds and that's cool, but nobody cares but us, right? Like we're the ones doing these webinars in the middle of the day on work days because we're super into this stuff. But that's not really the differentiating factor between us and our competitors from our passive investors' eyes. Like even if they're super savvy and they went to Princeton and they're going to call and say, okay, first question, what's the debt service coverage ratio? It's like, eh, stop. That is too cold. Like if you've ever read the book, pitch anything, these engineers slash accountants slash attorneys, they want to jump into these details, but super, super actually savvy investors know that the deal is almost inconsequential compared to the principles involved in making the key decisions. Full stop. Like that is so, so true. So if someone calls and the first question they ask is that, number one, they don't get to ask that question because the, the call starts like this. Hey, this is Hunter with ASIM Capital. How are you? Good. Hey, listen, I've got 30 minutes for this call because I have an investor call right after it. But if it's okay with you, I'd like to start out with asking you for a couple of questions about your background. And then I can share a bit about my background and happy to answer any questions you have. Sound good? Yes. That phrase right there is going to help you so much with your capital raising process because it shows that your time is limited, because you're the one directing the call, you're establishing the agenda, and you can ask them their background to establish where they are in terms of their sophistication so you can use vocabulary that's appropriate uh, for the rest of the call. Now, they may say, look, I'm not going to go into that. I just want to know what the debt service coverage ratio is. And, but the thing is, you're going to, in your mind and in reality, so shortly, if not already, you're going to get this deal funded no matter what. What you want to know is if they're the right investor for your deals, because we're going to be tied together for the next seven years. And if you can stop and say that to them, if they're trying to push these super analytical questions, eventually they will move on with their life, 
you don't have to deal with it anymore, but it's far more frequent. They'll say, you know what, that's actually correct. And that's really what I want to get to the bottom of as well. And then you can hear about it. What was their motivating factor? Are they concerned about the stock market because it doesn't provide cash flow, or is it because uh, they aren't really seeing a lot of appreciation or capital appreciation, or have they invested in five syndications before all in different asset classes, and you're going to be the sixth in a new asset class? These are very different things, and they're going to help. You're, they're going to give you the content that you need to then later repurpose to explain things in a way that makes them go, this is the person for me. Like, this is the only person I want to invest with like this. But you need to ask them those types of questions. And I'll, I'll just talk about one really important tool. I've talked about it before, which is this last straw moment concept. You know, in your journey to wherever you are, to investing in real estate, everybody, this is why it's so powerful. Everybody had this moment of like, damn, we have been lied to. Like when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, at some point, you probably said, damn, this is all made up. Like pretty much everything I've learned about the most important thing in life, how to pay for your food, is a lie. So what you want to do is try to pull that out from them, figure out what that thing was where they made that decision. I got to do something else. I'm interested in investing in this person's mobile home park deal or something. And then you can actually kind of mirror them and share yours because you guys both have that in common. Otherwise you wouldn't be on the call. So that'll help you. And by the way, that's the end of the whole call. It's a 30 minute call. There's not time for the debt service coverage ratio. Who are you? What's your background? What's your last straw moment? What's your key motivating factor? This is me. This is my background. This is my key motivating factor. And this is what I want to do. Okay. Uh, questions about the market. Great. The population's growing. You probably already know that it's a 150 unit asset. We're buying out of five cap and we think the market is, is a 4.5 cap. Amazing. Okay. That should cover most of the call because there's just not enough time. You want to get to know them. Now, some investors will want to do a follow-up call and is what I refer to as a due diligence call. And that's where you get super, super analytical and that's totally fine. But just remember, that's not where the sale happened. The sale happens in the introductory call as long as you establish that your time is limited and you have to stick it to that first 30 minutes. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that, awesome, awesome insights. And I think that, that plays itself to sales in general. I mean, having that connection point and understanding why they're investing, because people don't invest in real estate just to invest in real estate. They invest in real estate for uh, something, you know, whether that's, that's right. wanting to go travel for around the world or whether that's spending more time with their family or whatever else. So if you can connect with someone on that level and say, look, I understand why you want to do this. And this is why we think this, we could be a good match for this particular you know, strategy that we're going to employ, that's a more compelling answer than saying, you know, the debt service coverage ratio is 1.3 or whatever right. else. Right. Because again, I mean, you could line seven people up and they can say the exact same thing as far as the, the technical side is concerned. Totally. When it comes to, you know, you saying something that, and this is my why, this is why I'm doing this. And this is why I think that we can work together to reach this goal. That's way more compelling. And you'll stand out amongst the, the lineup any day of the week, I imagine. Exactly. The whole, the whole thing there is like is someone that comes in and is like, oh, what's the IRR? And it's like, I don't know, 16, 17, 18, like every single other deal you've been looking at, that's not really what's the determining, determining factor in, what, in terms of whether or not it's a good deal. You know what I mean? It's the principles and how they're going to act when things go sideways. Definitely. That's awesome advice. So I wanted to ask you one more question before we open up the Q&A, because we'll, we'll be opening up to the rest of the audience if they have any other questions in particular, and I'll also be checking on Facebook for those of you guys who are watching on Facebook. Um, so if you knew what you know now, and you were able to go back in time to the beginning, what, what one or two things would you change in, in your approach and just to kind of prioritize going forward so that you can you know, uh, take, take your business to the new heights? You know, I'll tell you this, and this is kind of counterintuitive, Maybe it's counter counterintuitive or whatever, but I, especially given when my career started and the timing and what the market looks like, I was a little bit too focused on cap rates and, um, and cash flow. And I know that that's something that you don't really hear that often because everyone always focuses on cash flow and cap rates, et cetera. But I think that if I could do it all over again, I would probably invest in slightly more prime markets in slightly lower cap rate environments. 
And maybe not in the very beginning of the recovery, because there was just so many great opportunities to buy great assets in the eight cap and nine cap range, as crazy as that sounds now. I mean, I remember a time where I said I would never buy something below a 10% cash flow in year one. So there was some hesitation there. And that's because of the mentors that I had at the time and, and still have to this day, but like just to super focus on cash flow. So my perspective is it leaves out a really important part of the equation, several, but one of them is the more liquidity you have in your assets, the easier it is to buy and sell and trade and borrow against them. And the easier it is to solve big problems because in the world of real estate, it's all about avoiding those principal loss situations, which almost are always related to debt financing in some capacity. So if I can make sure that I can, in a very short amount of time, sell an asset or borrow more money or blah, 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 or raise more money, by the way, that's going to lend myself to an Austin, Denver, Miami kind of situation, or let's say, you know, not 45 minutes outside of Greenswood, South Carolina, where you just don't have as many friends. You can't really say, I can solve this problem instantly. And so I invested in slightly more tertiary asset classes and tertiary markets, et cetera. By the way, those deals did incredibly well, but I think it's probably prudent to have more exposure to slightly more prime markets. And I don't mean San Francisco, New York, et cetera, but like an Austin, a Denver, you know, if you have an asset there, that's just humming along and you can refinance every seven years for the rest of your life. And by the way, for your children's life as well, that's a really good play. And I'll do more of that going forward. Oh, for sure. And again, those are the markets right now that are experiencing some of the most significant growth and probably will continue to experience quite sizable growth going forward. So again, right. you're, you're, you're taking advantage of some of the cash flow, but again, the appreciation component, which a lot of people, you know, say you shouldn't take into consideration. I mean, that's obviously a big, big, a big deal. So that's right. Can I add just one thing? Cause I've, this is yeah. a really important part of that. So if you sure. can you find an asset that is a hundred thousand dollars underperforming in terms of NOI. If you add that $100,000 to a five cap versus add that $100,000 of NOI to an eight cap, you're just getting such a better return on the five cap. So the same type of business plan implementation can go a lot further when that multiple of income is a 20X of NOI versus a 12X. Definitely. Well, that's some great advice. All right. So I wanted to keep it relatively short because I know a lot of people here are probably going to have some questions. So sure. if you guys uh, don't mind, uh, since there are a decent amount of people on the call, if you could just type away in the chat box, I'll be sure to ask the questions. And I'm also going to be checking on Facebook to make sure that uh, if you guys do have any questions in particular, that I make sure that they're being addressed. Yeah, make sure to do it. If you've ever struggled to raise money or you are still in the process of building out your platform, this is something that you know we've done over and over again, not just for us, but for our coaching clients as well. So make sure to ask and I will give you all the details as quickly as possible. Oh, for sure. All right. So feel free to chime away. I'm going to go ahead and be watching the chat box. Cool. Did you, have, did you have something in particular that you thought would be a value that I didn't ask you by chance? So I think that um, there's a lot, some hesitation going on right now because I think that the popularity of the space is changing so quickly that even someone that's been in it for six months can recognize that new podcasts are popping up and new websites and new syndicators. And I just want to paint a picture. I do have a bit of a background in economics and I just, we are in an echo chamber of real estate entrepreneurs and it feels like it's just me and Raphael and Michael Blanc and um, <laughs> you know, uh, those uh, Rod Cleef, et cetera. But that is not the case. I mean, if you look at the massive tsunami of liquidity heading the direction of the United States to the tune of tens of trillions of dollars, that money is searching for yield. And Bonds that are basically any first world country right now has a negative interest rate bearing bond. And so you've got this massive opportunity where people are starting to recognize they have, number one, there's positive interest rates in the United States. Okay. So that means potentially interest rates are likely going to be going down. And I know that's a counterintuitive argument, but I'm just very confident that we're going to see a prolonged low interest rate environment. Um, I also believe that as a real estate investor, you are in front of this massive tsunami of interest in the space where you're having success investing in real estate. That means your friends start to recognize this and start to do this. And that creates a situation where the, the 12 million accredited investors in the United States, most of which have no exposure to real estate, let alone the, as much as they need to 
from a financial planning perspective, there that interest, especially in millennials, is going to drastically increase over the next coming decades. So especially in the United States, we're just very well positioned to do that. So the time it takes to build a website, write 10 articles, and go on a few podcasts is just very well spent uh, in terms of you know achieving your real estate goals. Definitely. And, and, and I think you mentioned the, the significant wealth transfer that's going to occur over the next couple, 20, 20 plus years. I mean, the large baby boomer population is continuing to age. At a certain point, there will be a transfer of wealth. And at that point, if you're in a good position to capitalize, I mean, that could be a phenomenal opportunity for you going forward. So, Exactly. Real estate entrepreneurs need to be aware of trends. And obviously, the trend is that audio is going to be a huge factor going forward. The podcast medium is not slowing down anytime soon. And it's because it's not because it's a bubble. It's because it's very favorable on a risk adjusted basis. And you know, that's the name of my company, ASIM Capital. It's short for asymmetric returns. And so there's just pretty much no other way to get a more favorable asymmetric return than to buy a $300 microphone and to have conversations with people that you respect to the tune of even if they, the episodes were never launched and all you did was have a great networking and learning opportunity that alone would pay for the $300 investment and may even change your career. So I'm just a very big proponent of people investing in themselves and building out their platform because the downside is basically nothing. And the upside is, you know, all your wildest dreams in terms of finance. Oh my gosh. And not only that, but the, the opportunity to repurpose content. So for example, this will be filmed. Uh, we're going to record this. We're going to post it on YouTube. Then we're going to take this and put it in a podcast format. Then we're going to take this snips and start posting it on different platforms. So yep. from a, from a uh, reach perspective, it could be compelling. And all it took was an investment of an hour and a few emails back and forth with one another to get this thing scheduled. And this could pay dividends for, de for decades. That's right. Uh, realistically. So, so you're right. And I, and that's why I thought it was so important what you said in your book related to brand building and, and becoming that go-to expert. And obviously we're all here to learn. We're all here to grow. And you could take some of the, the highlights you took from this experience. And why don't you go, you know, write about, you know, what I learned in this particular podcast episode from, you know, our conversation, you know, that, totally. that could be a piece of content. Um, Let and, me actually, and, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No. Yeah. That's, that was that. A, yeah. Um, I just got excited, but basically when you're in the pursuit of this, which is, he's absolutely right, where to create replicatable, repeatable, reusable pieces of content that can touch people in different ways is very, very powerful. You'll start to recognize how consuming it can be, but something that's really fun, if you're attending a conference, if you're going to a webinar, if you're just going to even have a conversation with an investor, number one, pay attention to what's going on because you don't want to be present, but also think about what's what you can intuit by reading between the lines that no one else is seeing. And that is going to be the thing that attracts your dream investors. So when I'm at a conference and there's a speaker that maybe even they don't even really apply to me, or I think they're boring or whatever, what I'm trying to do is, man, what can I pull out of this? That'll be a good way for me to put an interesting spin on something that everyone is in the same room, watch the same content, but no one is going to think the way that I'm thinking. I'm trying to do that because that's the thing, again, that makes someone go, oh my gosh, that's so right. And if I was thinking about that just a little bit more, I would have thought the exact same thing. It feels really good. How many times have you listened to a podcast? Let's say it's unrelated to real estate. You guys are all experts in real estate, so maybe it applies to you. But let's say you're listening to whatever like political pundit you like or whatever. And it's not really the thing you spend all your time doing. But whenever you feel like, oh, that's so me. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, oh, that, that is so me. You know what I mean? Well, that's, that's a really powerful feeling. So we're trying to pull that out. Oh, for sure. Oh, that's some great advice. Yeah. And that's why I also think it's so important to read stuff. I mean, obviously real estate content is extremely important, but it's also good to kind of branch out and look at other forms of content that I read biographies a ton. You know, I read, sometimes I read uh, fiction books, uh, especially if they're very, if they're classics, because again, it kind of, uh, kind of gives me a different perspective on, you know, a, a different, a different realm that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So. Okay. Can I make a comment about kind of converting pitch decks into webinar presentations? Oh, for sure. Yeah, that'd be okay. awesome. I know you mentioned that in the book, so that's awesome. So once you've done all this work and you've become an expert and you've kind of, you've identified a deal, you got it under contract, you even created a pitch deck for the property, which I refer to as an executive summary. You've done so much work. All you have to do is then repurpose that same content and put it into another medium so that people that like to learn visually as opposed to just reading can digest more easily. And so you simply take that pitch deck, 
put it into PowerPoint, mostly bullet points, animate the bullet points, use as many photos as you can, and literally just basically read through the executive summary that you yourself wrote. That can be very, very powerful because now when someone joins our mailing list right now and you can, you can hack our exact email templates, all you got to do is sign up for our mailing list as a, you know, a passive investor. Asimcapital.com, the first email you're going to get is a welcome email that talks about who we are as a company. The second email you're going to get is a kind of a, a success stories and client kind of relationships types of situation. The third email is the investment opportunity. The fourth is a webinar for that investment opportunity. The fifth is a frequently asked questions about this investment opportunity. And the sixth is some scarcity around the timing of when the funding deadline is. By the way, there's no prompt for a call in that. But so what happens is this is a fully automated capital raising robust system that we've built out so that, and I tell people to go and, hey, you'll copy our whole email list. But guess what? Someone on this call may go through and give us $100,000. It's automated because of that. And if you don't, of course, that's fine with me, but you should go through and your competitors that are out there that are succeeding, you should go through, look at the emails and try to intuit what is the difference between my email list and theirs that is allowing them to have success. So it's not always easy to see the difference between these things are like what goes on behind the scenes is really important. That's a really good start to create kind of a email thread for whenever someone opts into your ebook. It shouldn't just be ebook, schedule a call. Hey, you didn't schedule a call. All right, never talk to you again. What people get put into when they opt into us is they're going to get contacted until one of us dies. I mean, that's it. But we have to know exactly when to contact them, how frequently, and if they opt into something, perhaps they can get a more frequent rate, a rate of comp, uh, communication, et cetera. So it's a very robust kind of thing. But all I'm saying is get started thinking about it like that if you're not already. Oh, for sure. And, and I like the idea of you looking at other people's content. So signing yes. up for different opt-ins and then trying to just pick people's perspective on, on what their, their email campaigns are. I mean, I'm, I definitely don't have nearly the, the, the robust email campaign that I'm sure you, you have, but I'm sure I could learn a ton from just, you know, re registering for, for your email list and then just seeing what emails come in and draw some inspirations from there and say, okay, let me try this out in my own business or whatever else. So yes. I really appreciate you sharing that insight. That That's is awesome. so, so powerful. You know, these, um, you know, email marketers will say like, Hey, we'll sell you our exact email templates for $97. But you can probably just go to their website and like opt into their free thing and just take it for yourself. You know what I mean? So yeah, same yeah. thing with me. That's awesome. So we have actually one question coming in on our Facebook page. It's from Ray. Hey, Ray, how's it going? So he's asking you, what is your why? And I think you kind of touched on it earlier in the, in the podcast, but I thought we'd kind of elaborate a little bit more on that. You know, the... The first thing that all of us probably get into this industry for, the first motivating thing is the combination of the, the money and the freedom, the personal freedom, right? We're like, okay, I can see this as being a vehicle to maybe not even caring about money, but really just about the personal freedom that goes along with the passive cash flow dynamic in real estate, which is very unique. But once you start to kind of achieve that, you either fizzle out or you get completely re-inspired by someone else's success. And that, that's what's happened to me, right? So I work crazy hours, which is, I'm not super proud of that. I'm about to make a huge investment in a CFO to ensure that I don't have to do that. But I am inspired all day, every day, because I feel truly morally obligated to help people get money out of the stock market and into predictable cash flow streams that are recession resistant with favorable debt financing. Like that sounds a little bit wordy and maybe a bit technical, but like I literally am... I feel like that's like why I was put on this planet. And then the other side of our business is to help people raise money for their deals. And that over the last two years in particular, that has started to be like, when we start, to, you know, two years is enough to start to see some success stories and have people that couldn't raise their first half million now raise $2 million every time they put out a deal. You know, I got a, a Voxer recently from a coaching client that I literally, I listened to it and was just like silent. I went to the bathroom and just cried. Like, because their mission, they're so focused on, they have a very specific mission and they're in the process of accomplishing it. And we've played a role in them accomplishing it. And it's just like, you know, it's just so, I'm very grateful to be able to be in a position to where my book, for example, has helped people revolutionize their capital raising system. And our coaching client thing is just basically a more robust and integrated version of that. Man, th good question, by the way. 
That's all that matters, right? And if you don't have a good answer for that, you'll fizzle out because this industry is lucrative. And the moment you start to really make some money, you go, nah, I'm good. I, I accomplished really what I got in this industry for. But if you find something where you're like, oh no, this other person really depends on me, then it's not about you and your problems anymore. You've got to get to work and make it work and think bigger and give more and more influence and more, more charitable, more philanthropy, more vacations, more private school, whatever your goals are, there's no ceiling to this. I know this is a bit of a rant. This is a really important piece right here. As real estate entrepreneurs, we're trained to look at comps and that's not the way entrepreneurship works. It's the way real estate works. So if you have an asset in, let's say San, uh, San Antonio that rents for $1,000 a month, and you're about to buy a property that you think is going to rent for $1,000 a month, but currently rents for $800 a month. You're basically using the comps as where your property should be renting, right? We do the same thing as entrepreneurs. We say, well, that person raised $2 million in their raise and has $50 million under management. Well, that's like, he's up there and I'm not there yet. So I'm going to keep working, but that's the ceiling. But like, you know, in my book, I told a story about someone that raised $100 million without even having an assistant, okay? At the time I wrote the book, I had raised $30 million. Now I've raised 50. So I can't even tell that story anymore because it's not, I raised $50 million. I was going, oh my God, this guy raised 100, this guy raised 100, this guy raised 100. A couple of years later, I've raised 50. And now I have to change. I have to realize, wait a minute, there's a company that raised $10 billion last year and you don't even know their name because they didn't even blink in terms of the macroeconomic picture. That's how big the opportunity is. You can add three zeros or six zeros and no one even know. So like, I love that. And that's why I like speaking to these groups, right? Because different people have different layers of success. And when you get in a group like this, you recognize, damn, there is no ceiling. That's really powerful. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great point. And, and again, like you said, this business, and, and I'm relatively new in the business myself, you have to have some sort of reason to continue to go. Because again, life is short and you want to make sure that your highest and best use is being fulfilled. And that's awesome that you actually are, have been able to at least identify what it is you're put on this earth for. And it, you can tell because of all the, the content you produce and it comes from like a giving back, giving heart, which I think is phenomenal. So I commend you for that, really. I appreciate it. If you're in the process of creating content, I would suggest kind of doing something similar where do not write articles just based on keyword research. Don't do just fluff. I would say write articles where your dream investors are going to be like, damn, this is like potentially life-changing information, you know? So my book, for example, which I really appreciate that you've read it, it was not intended to be a New York Times bestseller. It was intended to give people the playbook that are actually interested in doing it. And so like when you reach out and say, I loved your book, I'd love to have you speak. I'm like, well, I got you because like you're my dream client. Right. So, and it's not everybody. So anyway, appreciate that. Oh, of course. All right. We may have enough time for one more question. We're running up right on the hour right now. So if anyone has any other questions. Okay. Well, I think, I mean, you, I think you answered all the questions we had today, Hunter. I really, I really do appreciate you coming by and stopping by this, uh, the, the meetup. I know that you've been able to provide a ton of value for those of you guys who are listening uh, via Zoom and then on Facebook as well. This will be recorded, so we'll be posting this on the on our YouTube channel, uh, so you guys can consume it in perpetuity. But and anything else you want to say? How how can people get in contact with you? How can people, if they want to, you know, consume some more of your content? How can they reach out to you? We're about to run a webinar on this topic, and um, we've done a couple. It's a live webinar. Um, you can check it out at Raising Capital for Real Estate forward slash Never dash Scramble, and I'll put the URLs in there. And then also my book is available at raisingcapitalforrealestate.com. But um, so the webinar is kind of, we talk about what we talked about today, the attract, educate, nurture, close system. And then we talk about our mastermind as well. And I'll link about, I'll link both of those. It's not just fluff though. Like it's a 90 minute presentation and you, you know, just from the conversation today, my goal is to like really pump the value in and I, I'm sure you get a lot out of it. So even if you have a lot of experience in the space, because I learned a lot putting the presentation together. It's 90, excuse me, 110 slides of just like, so. <laughs> so I'm taking, I'm actually going to take these links and I'm going to post them in the description on the YouTube channel and also on the podcast episode. So if you guys are Great. listening, feel free to jump in there and then click the links. But uh, again, Hunter, thank you so much for stopping by. I really do appreciate your time. Thanks to all the members who stopped by and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for joining via uh, video, Masha. I appreciate it. Talk to you guys soon. <laughs> Peace. All right. See you guys.